Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. All right, cool. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just no, thought that was I, a good segue. It, I, I thought this, <laughs> you can't hurt my feelings today, Frank. And uh, uh, Well, I'm, I'm not even going to try. I know. Um, <laughs> all right. Hello, and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And as always uh, with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway is Andy Leonard. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing okay, Frank. How are you? I'm doing okay. I've been I've been a bit busy. Um, I I um, uh, I don't know if we mentioned this in last week's show, but I basically I fractured. I have a hairline fracture on my foot, so I've been limping around. Ouch. Um, but um, it was pretty. You know, uh, uh, today is the first day I can get around without the scooter or a cane. So okay. calling that a win. That that sounds like a win, and I know yeah. just from our personal chats that you've had a whirlwind uh, thirty six hours or so. Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't even remember the last thirty six hours. <laughs> I I have to I have to look at my phone to see what day of the week it is. But yeah, so I'm there uh, too. But it's good. I mean, uh, last night uh, the my my older son had a science fair. Um. They they don't give out like prizes or awards. It's kind of uh, everybody gets a trophy type okay. environment. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. But um, what was interesting was he did a project on maglev maglev trains, and so did two other kids. So it was like the one where everybody had like you know, it seemed like that was the the theme. Gotcha. And I'm, I'm I, I don't know why I would assume maybe they mentioned it in school, but but he swears they didn't. Huh um maybe it's because they want to put a maglev train between uh, baltimore and dc yep i don't know which would cut the trip down to 15 minutes wow um and then i think ultimately they want to ultimately i think want to replace the acela with with this but that's billions of dollars and decades away yeah and i've always you know me in news I, i rarely keep up with the news but i did see a blurb on social media about uh, some train project in California. Uh, it sounded like they had canceled it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, that was not maglev though. Oh, okay, okay. They 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 blew the budget on that on, on regular technology. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> well, you know, I've been to um, Europe some, and mm-hmm. uh, of course, you grew up in uh, New Jersey, and you know, you've been you've also lived in Europe for a while. The mm-hmm. um, the train systems there just seem amazing to me. And I live in Farmville and we recently, I say recently, probably in the last 10 years, we removed several miles of track uh, and turned it into uh, kind of a, a trail and a park, which I'm not against trails and parks. I think that's awesome. And I love this particular trail. There's a lot of history here. Uh, there was a civil war battle fought near high bridge uh, Farmville and the, the bridge is beautiful and it is very high. But it is, um, it's disappointing that we're not doing more with rail uh, here. And I, I, I know there's a number of factors that play into that. I promise I'm not trying to make a political statement. I just, um, I just wish that, um, that we were kind of moving in the other direction, that we were doing more uh, with, with rail transportation and, um, and not less. So. Right, right. Uh, when in, in the course of him doing his project, I was very optimistic about uh, Hyperloop technologies mm. but when he was doing the research on it it was like when i when you look at the cost per mile for hyperloop right right uh yeah i'm not as optimistic as i was well the, the economics play you know play a role in it i almost said the optics right. but they do too um but yeah certainly a lot of this is driven by um you know by economic concerns i totally get that being a data person um you know, I, I use economic analogies an awful lot talking about data development, software development. And, um, you know, it, it's a it's a very realistic way to to kind of um, to measure the impact of, of an investment, uh, certainly to measure the impact of debt. 
and um, right. talk a lot about technical debt and technical investments. It's, it's what was interesting and uh, was the Maryland project, the, the who was opposed to it is, is an interesting mix of, 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 of people, which I was kind of surprised is yeah. not, not to get political, but um, no. it would be cool though, to go from Baltimore to DC in like 15 minutes. It, you it could... would be. And you know, I, I will, I will broach the political barrier on this. I find people, on both, you know, both sides of the aisle and people in the middle that are in support and opposed uh, to, to projects like this. And, you know, and I, I try to see all sides. I try to be very empathetic. Um, as we say in Farmville, uh, sometimes I feel for you, but I can't quite reach you. <laughs> uh, that's redneck snark and just just in case you you didn't know okay that went right over my head well sorry we, you, we've had this conversation frank you are a redneck you're just farther north than most oh well there you go there you go <laughs> it's a culture of honor thing that's the culture of honor that's right well but uh, our guest could actually if he if he wanted to could scoot up to baltimore from dc he could and correct? i was going to say speaking of economics anders has has some real passion um, about leveling the playing field and, um, you know, helping people. And uh, just a little from Anders, uh, Anders Schneiderman is a, um, he's the director at a project called the Makers All Project. Uh, you can find his website at makersall.org. Sounds just like it's uh, spelled just like it's sound. Makers is plural, then all.org. And I first met Anders years ago. Um, he was a manager at a not-for-profit or non-profit and the consultants that were working on his data warehouse, you'll have to tell the story correctly, Anders, but they basically indicated to you, they were doing some SSIS work for you and they were reading this book, uh, SSIS design patterns. And you had enough gumption to go onto LinkedIn, connect with me and drop me an email and, and our communication on LinkedIn and said, you know, do you do consulting? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah. And we started communicating. I ended up doing some work there. I'm still actually doing some work at the organization. You've left. Cool. And, um, but yeah, we're still helping them here and there whenever we, they need help. But Anders and I not only got to work together, um, we became friends really quickly. And I will share, because Anders is too polite to, that uh, we disagree philosophically on politics. We got that close. We became that close friends. But we realized quickly that although we're on different sides of the aisle, we share a lot of the same goals. We just disagree about like details and, and implementation. And ours has been a relationship where uh, I will say for me, I have learned and gained and grown from communicating with Anders about things, uh, specifically things with which we disagree. Um so um, Anders is, just to kind of bring this into the, into the present, Anders is working on a report. Um, he has been working on this report for a while. He's been thinking about this, and we'll talk about some of his other endeavors as we move through the interview today. But um, what I, uh, one of the many things I love about Anders is his heart for people. He wants to help. And he is one of these folks that is not just going to talk about the weather. He's going to try and do something about it. I've, uh, I've read the executive summary of the report. Uh, I find it to be compelling and uh, very solution oriented. And I can't wait to dive into this some more and talk some more about this. Anders, welcome. Yeah, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me on. No problem. No problem. So I think this this conversation kind of started about uh, what the jobs are going to be like in the future. And then uh, Andy and I got to talking about uh, Appalachia or Appalachia. Yep. And what the future of, of work looks like there. So do you want to talk about that, Anders? Sure. Um, before I do, I just wanted to say thanks, Andy, for saying so many generous things about me and uh Right back at you. The, definitely, this report. Uh, you can see the impact of uh, of our friendship uh, on it. Oh, um, sure. So, um, the reason why I ended up writing this report is that um, I became increasingly concerned about um, whether or not robots and AI were going to end up destroying lots of jobs, or if there were still a lot of jobs created that a lot of jobs wouldn't be very good paying jobs. And um, at the same time, 
um, it was becoming increasingly clear that not just robotics and AI, but also augmented reality, virtual reality, digital fabrication, a whole host of emerging tech is taking off and in the next 20 years is going to create a huge amount of wealth. And so I started thinking about how do we make it possible for you know, areas like Appalachia, Compton, et cetera, how to make it possible for communities that have basically been left behind um, to be able to get in on this wealth um, so that they can help rebuild themselves. And that's basically what the report's about. Oh, interesting. So um, you mentioned two communities in particular, Appalachia and Compton. I assume you mean Compton, California. That's right. For our foreign listeners, if you're right. familiar with NWA or Dr. Dre, <laughs> that's where those guys are from. Um, but um, so, uh, and, and we've been wanting to get a, a real honest to God economist on the show to talk about this because uh, one of the things that comes up inevitably when you talk about AI is the destruction of jobs, the mass destruction of jobs. Um, right. And um, if the jobs are not massively destroyed, you kind of see what we we've had over the last 20 years when, you know, the, the big flip to a service economy where really only the high skilled workers kind of see any kind of meaningful wage growth and everybody else is kind of, for lack of a better term, SOL. Right. Uh, how, how bad does the future look? Um, what I finally decided was after reading lots of reports and thinking about looking at the data is no one seems to have an actively working magic eight ball. And so the answer is we can't really know, but that doesn't mean we can't therefore do something about it. Um, I grew up in upstate New York and uh, the main thing I learned from upstate New York is if it looks like it's going to rain, bring an umbrella, right? If you don't <laughs> know, think about what you could do that would work either way. Um, because it might be that, um, robots and AI end up destroying huge numbers of jobs, um, particularly because the rate of automation is happening at a much faster clip than it used to. Um, for example, when, um, when let's see, wheat was automated, I think in the 1930s and 40s, it really started taking off uh, the harvesting of wheat. Um, they didn't really figure out how to harvest tomatoes until about 20 years later. And in fact, originally people said this is impossible. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of other agricultural um, crops that took longer still. We're not talking about 20 years in between um, various rounds of automation. We're talking like 10 maybe. Um, and um, social factors are going to have a big impact on that, obviously. Like, you know, if we even if we could... Um, automate uh, home care work or nursing work in a nursing home, it's not clear what we'd want to. But if you look at the rate that AI has been, you know, getting better and better in the past uh, 10 years, it's enough to, to me to say it's reasonable to expect that we could end up losing something like between 20 and 70% of all jobs and not having enough jobs replaced. We could also get lucky and that wouldn't happen. Right. But uh, there the danger is um, if a bunch of jobs disappear over the next 20 to 30 years and they get replaced over the next 20 or 30 years, then we're doing fine. If a bunch of jobs get dis destroyed in the next 10 years and then in another 10 years and then another 10 years, um, in other words, if you get waves of automation, even the fact that there are jobs coming down the line isn't going to help a lot of people. And you end up with a lot of people who are basically stuck. Right. Um, and then there are a lot of jobs that may get created that don't pay well. So for example, um, if you are building um, an AI and you need a huge amount of data um, tagged um, because you're doing um, supervised learning, right now what you do is you use um, monster tasks or a whole number of, of, of online services where you can basically plug in hundreds or thousands of people around the globe who will help you do the work that AI can't do. And similarly, you know, AI at this point can't um, handle a lot of customer service calls. So when they get to the point where it's a customer service call that, that the bot can't handle, it gets passed seamlessly in the back to a human. 
Um, so there are lots of jobs doing that, and uh, they pay really, really poorly. So regardless of whether or not we lose lots of jobs or we have a decent number of jobs, but there's too much turnover or there are a lot of jobs that they don't pay well, we need a strategy that's going to be able to um, ensure that um, communities just don't go down the drain. Right. And I noticed in reading the executive summary uh, to your report, your report, which the executive summary, I find uh, uh, very compelling. Uh, you you take a three, uh, kind of a three-point sermon approach here, where you talk about initially smoothing the learning curve, and then kind of combining an ecosystem of uh, both tech and community, which I you know I find compelling. I, I keep using that word, but uh, it's the best word I can come up with to to describe it. But your community evolves uh, from a combination of, of tech and community into tech and civic. And, and I, again, very, very interesting approach. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the basic idea is um, I think we've got a lot to learn with uh, from what happened in agriculture back in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century through this program right. called Extension Services. Um, America was going through a similar transformation where if you're going to have an industrialized industrialized society, if you're going to have a a uh, service-oriented society, farmers have to be able to produce a whole lot more crops because otherwise most people won't be able to get off the farm. And after about 50 years of trying and failing with different experiments, they came up in 1910 with the idea of extension services. And the idea there was um, in every county in the United States, uh, there would be extension agents who would work on two things. One was working with folks in the community to take all this really complicated knowledge and science and tools and techniques of modern agriculture and break them down and make them easier for folks to learn. And the second thing is help build up monthly clubs and state fairs and 4-H clubs and all these other ways that someone who's a full-time farmer could not only learn without having to go to college, but could also learn from their peers, um, from people who understand where they're coming from, who understand the problems we're facing. And I'm essentially arguing that we need to do something similar on a similar scale, where we, we make the tech significantly easier to learn by using the same user experience or user UX techniques we've used to make the front ends of webs and apps easier, we need to start applying that to the back end uh, for everyday adults to make coding, getting started in coding less hard to do. We need to create a much more robust system of support ranging from making it so that folks who are in a community where there aren't a whole lot of programmers can bump into coding not just by going to a class, but by maybe through their barber shop or their church or as a friend of mine who was recently uh, suggesting NASCAR, um, you'd, you'd find lots of ways that people sort of get their feet wet and you'd build up um, more, more robust uh, support for folks f- around and from people in the community so that um, they can get p- folks and get over one of the biggest hurdle, which is feeling I'm too stupid to be able to do this. And then the last piece um is we want people to learn how to do the tech. But as all we're already seeing in the case of AI, the tech alone is not enough, right? Like in the last year or two, it's become increasingly clear that um, ethics and in general thinking about what is the impact of the technology and building is going to matter. Um, and that's going to be even more so as robots, AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, digital fabrication take off because they're going to end up shaping the economy in really profound ways. And if we want to make sure that every community has a chance to benefit from that, we need to make sure that folks who are getting technically trained also get some training in, how do I go about um, helping to have an impact on society? How do I go about having impact on the standards that are being set, um, on the priorities that that get set? So yeah, it's those three prongs, uh, two of which come out of looking at this incredibly successful prog- program we did in agriculture and saying what we need is something comparable uh, on the same scale and scope in the world of emerging tech. Interesting. I think, um, uh, I think the pieces and parts are kind of already in motion. If you look at user group communities, meetups, um, 
as well as uh, uh, the Maker Fair movement or the Maker movement, uh, I've noticed that uh, my local library has a, a maker space. Right. But I think you're right. I think it's not it's not evenly applied. And I right. think you, you hit on the number one, uh, at least for me, the number one nerve item is that they think that people people can't don't think they can do this. Right. How do you get over that? Because I mean, we live in a time. I promise, Andy, I won't get too much on the soapbox. We live in a time where if you have internet access, you can find out how to change a light bulb, fix a toilet, <laughs> or perform brain surgery. So, so like, what? How how do we address that? Because people, is it learned helplessness? Is it a crisis of confidence? What is it? Yeah, I think it's two things. One is the tech is still too hard to to, uh, to learn. And it's not that it's impossible to learn. Lots of people do, right? You've got MOOCs and, as you said, user groups and so on that have been quite effective for a relatively small percentage of the population. If we want to go further than that, then essentially what we need to do is we need to start asking, okay, so if you're a beginner and you're from a community where there aren't a lot of people programming, how do we make this, you know, uh, these machine learning libraries or uh, the coding you need to do in order to do augmented reality easier and designed around metaphors that make sense to people in that community, um, what I'm calling community-oriented coding UX. Um, so that's one piece, like bring the tech closer to folks. Um, the other is if you have, if you basically take what we've been doing with user groups and so on and you do it on a a bigger scale um, with more of an eye towards, like right now, most of the user groups that we have are essentially self-selected, right? Like the people who are getting the training are the people show up. Right. Um, and uh, in the report, I use an example from healthcare of, of a strategy we might use that was used by extension services. Um, so one of the things that a lot of uh, doctors struggle with is how do I reach people who um, have high blood pressure and are not taking medications regularly or are not getting tested. And what they did was they um, they built a network of barbershops and uh, local pharmacies in an inner city, area, inner city area that had a very large, large number of folks who were not getting um, tested, who were high risk. And what they found compared to control, control group, I think the control group, maybe 10% of the people um, who were involved ended up having their blood pressure go to back to normal. And in the more community-oriented approach, 60% did. Wow. And the reason oh, they wow. did, yeah, the reason they did was because it, I think there was an African-American community where, you know, barbershops are a really important social institution and where folks have often had, you know, very strong connections with their barbers. So if you're going in there, you got already, already this person you trust. You're surrounded by people you know and trust. And so it's not at all as intimidating as going into um, a doctor's office. Uh, the same strategy was used, uh, which I also talk about in the report, through um, uh, citizenship schools in the 1960s in the civil rights movement. They had this big challenge of how do we go about, um, if we, we large numbers of African Americans are trying to vote, and there are all these rules in the Deep South that say you can't vote unless you can read or write. Um, how do we train all these people who are, you know, um, peasant farmers, essentially, um, who are literate to become literate in a pretty short amount of time? And community-oriented citizenship schools were the answer. And what they did was really smart and similar to what Extension Services did, which is first, when they would go into a community where they're setting up a school, they would look for what they called natural leaders. In other words, people who already were parts of um, real world, not online, social networks, who people in the community trusted and respected. Um, right. So, for example, one of the first people to run one of the trainings of, of a citizenship school uh, was the head of a local beauty parlor. And she was like, you know, I've been talking to people about their lives since forever. I know everybody. So she's having a class uh, or, or she says it's worth coming Um a lot more people are going to go. And also, if they're nervous, they think, I can't do this. She understands where they're coming from. She knows how to talk to them. She was able to get them to go to the class. And then the classes themselves were designed in a community-oriented way where you, you know, it's not, 
If I'm teaching an ex miner about uh, miner as in like coal mining, how to do JavaScript programming, and I say, of course you can do this. You're smart. Da da da. They're gonna be like, whatever. You don't know me. You're not right. in my community. <laughs> if I've worked with a number of ex coal miners and train them up on JavaScript. And so they're talking to people in the community, their friends, their neighbors, um, then folks are going to be much more likely to um, to feel comfortable. And in fact, um, it'll even be a good way of getting around some of the issues that are not just issues of comfort about the tech, but rather how you see yourself. Like a number of people have said, we can't possibly train millions of people to become programmers. Um, because we've got all these people who are blue collar, who work with their hands, particularly men, where their identity is tied up in the fact that they do manual work, unlike those, you know, people off uh, typing with keyboards. And so it's not just learning a new skill, it's changing how they think about themselves. Well, I'm going to have a really hard time breaking through that barrier. Somebody else who spent their life working with their hands is much more likely to be able to reach them and say, this is really like how we did blah, blah, blah in mining or, 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 you know, bring some other analogy. So I think the way you break down those barriers is by harnessing the power of community and by making the tech less intimidating. Right. And especially uh, uh, the, the working with your hands thing, I think um, programming now is, I think, at a, also at a crossroads. Because if you look at IoT and the stuff that you could do with Raspberry Pis and the right. soldering there, there's a very, if you want to keep doing that hands-on stuff, you easily could. I mean, how much, how much the, so, so this might be a, 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 a sidetrack, but that's kind of what we do around here. Uh, <laughs> how much do you think like um, teaching entrepreneurship would help with this? Because you could, you could, you could say to someone who's like, they like to work with their hands. Well, what if, you know, you, you could add code to a particular thing you do with your hands you solder up prototypes and then you can ship it to a place and then boom, you can build your next, you can have like this device that's smart. Like how do you, I mean, is that, is that a reasonable type of approach? Absolutely. In fact, the only reason I didn't, I, I mentioned it somewhere in the 70 pages worth of report. Um, the only reason why I didn't talk about it more was that my head was going to explode if I added one more idea in, but right, right. Um, no, I think what you need is, um, a combination of training training people about the tech, training people about how to run a business, and training them about how to be community advocates. Um, right. And if you have those three, then you'll give people the, the overall tools that they need, not just so that they as an individual can start learning it, but so they can create businesses, they can create co-ops, and they can start reshaping their community so more people can get involved so that their community can be made whole. Right. Well, and I know, Anders, too, that uh, you have a particular passion for uh, for inner cities, for economies that are suffering. Um, and, and so what drives that? Why Compton? Why Appalachia? Um, well, two reasons. One um, is it comes out of my faith. Um, I believe strongly that, you know, I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. And when I see my brothers and sisters suffering, um, I want to help them help themselves. Um, I think it's also critical for us as a democracy. Um, I think that there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley who are very well-meaning people who, well, for instance, they didn't realize that they could go on their merry way and basically say, ah, who cares about what happens in flyers, flyover states? And the folks in Florida State still get to vote and the folks and people in West Virginia still get to vote. Right. And so even if you don't, you know, even if you don't care about other people, there's a real in reason why in tech we need to figure out how to make this work for everyone. Um, so it's both religious, you know, my, my religious values, my, my values in general, and also sort of hard-nosed politics. And the, and the last piece is <laughs> I firmly believe um that if we want to, if we actually do this, we will end up with a much, much bigger pie um, that will end up with much more wealth for everyone. Um, and in the report, I have a section called Hip Hop Was Not Created by Sound Engineers. Um, <laughs> and what I point out is, um, which actually I'd learned from um, 
of folks in the hip hop community, since I know very little about hip hop, um, is that when hip hop hip hop first took off, um, one of the, the key foundational pieces was figuring out that you could use a record player, not just for playing a record, but as an instrument for scratching. Right. And um, that was not, you know, essentially taking that tool and morphing it into another tool. That didn't require a PhD in engineering. Um, one of the people who made that happen, Grandmaster Flash, had gone to a vocational school and learned a little bit about sound. But basically, um, he wasn't a scientist. He was a mad scientist. He spent all this time obsessively playing around and experimenting and so on, uh, doing essentially split A-B testing, if you will. Right. Um, and you know, and and you know, help found this whole new school of music that had a deep and profound impact on our culture. And if you look at the cultures of you know, from Compton to um, Harlan County, you'll you know, communities that have been left behind almost always have very rich cultural traditions. Yes. And I think that if we can, if we empower people in those communities, or if we more importantly, we give them the power to empower themselves that um you know what happened with uh you know brooklyn and and so on with uh hip-hop will happen in this area like you know i i want to find out i want to see who will be the grandmaster flash of augmented and virtual reality for instance that's actually a good point um so uh, a couple of things uh one it's really good uh kind of fictionalized account of the birth of hip-hop in um in a netflix uh movie yeah called the get down Yes. And uh, that, that I would have been probably about my son's ages uh, when about when that happened. So like when I saw that, I saw the, you know, the big Cadillacs and stuff. And, you know, that was that was, you know, near where I live. So it, it kind yeah. of spoke to me. And there was definitely, um, um, you know, there's definitely something to that. And, and what's interesting is, I think, an unintended consequence of the um, – the 1977 blackout was that uh only a handful of people had turntables and the type of gear right uh to to do that grandmaster flash probably being one of them and uh, one of the characters is 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 heavily based on grandmaster flash and the get down mm -hmm. and um so what was uh what's particularly interesting is the blackout uh, a lot of stereos went you know, missing right. uh, <laughs> uh, and they were distributed. So that kind of became, there was actually one scene in the movie where, you know, it was only like two or three, they called them crews uh, in the Bronx. And then suddenly, you know, within, you know, two weeks, there was 40 or 50 of them Right, kind of had this explosive effect. Um, and no, I agree. So, so short of a massive blackout, what, <laughs> uh, you know, what could we do to, to kind of, um, you know, put the kindling into that? Because I think you're right. I think the raw material is there. It just has to be set afire. That's a great question. Um, I think parts of what I'm talking about, I, I think, have to be done by the government. But I think this actually is a piece that can be done entirely by uh, the tech world, and particularly by the big tech companies. Um, right now, you've got this sort of scramble to see, for instance, in, in the area of um, augmented and virtual reality, uh, where Microsoft just came out with a new HoloLens 2 um, on Sunday, um, there's a, a big fight brewing over who's going to get what slice of the, of the pie over the augmented and virtual reality world. And um, Microsoft, um, Google, Amazon, a couple other companies, um, Apple, Facebook, are all trying to, to figure out how do we gain a competitive advantage here. My thought is, um, you know, folks in um, Compton or West Baltimore or Electors County, Kentucky, are not going to be going and buying $3,500 HoloLens um, sets in order to become developers. Right. But if something like Microsoft said, we're going to do a couple of pilot projects in communities where we already have relationships um, through Black Girls Code or a number of other community groups that they give money to. And what we're going to do is we're going to work on, we're going to bring our tech to folks early on, um, and we're going to uh, donate it to them and, um, you know, through community groups, through some kind of sort of churches, some kind of social institutions, um, and then work with them on how do we make the tech easier to use through community-oriented UX. 
um, two things will happen. First, you'll get a bunch of people who have a shot at beginning to do some interesting work that will sort of lay the seeds uh, for, you know, the equivalent of the homebrew computer club in a number of, of regions that um, our society has left behind. But the other thing that will happen is one of the experiences I, I have learned uh, over and over in my, my 30 years in tech is that if you can teach someone in the community how to do something in tech, how to do programming, um, how to use complicated technology, um, you can probably pretty easily use the same techniques to um, teach someone who's in marketing. Um, and if Microsoft or Google or Amazon works with these communities to figure out how do we make their, our, our um, tech much easier to, for people to do really interesting creative work, it will also mean many, many more people in, um, in corporations will be able to. Um, and in fact, if you look at um, when IBM first put huge amounts of money into AI and they built all this really cool stuff and they went out to their corporate partners and they said, or their, their, their customers said, here's this cool stuff. And what they discovered was their, their, uh, the folks in, in, in the corporate world were like, uh, that's nice. How do I use this? Um, this is too complicated. Um, particularly, again, not like the techies, but the people in the marketing, the people in, in the back end and so on. Um, and so they ended up creating a bunch of computer consulting to help people learn this. Well, if you you essentially say, let's start at the beginning rather than waiting till later to make it easier to use. Let's work with folks in the community um, to make the tech easier to use. We'll be helping the community. So we'll be doing something that's good and civic. Um, we'll be creating new businesses in the community, but we'll also be directly helping ourselves in the markets that have the most amount of money where we want to have the most number of people using our tools. Well, right. I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think I think you did a you mentioned the homebrew computer scene of the I guess sixties and seventies. I mean, I don't think people really realize that, you know, the the people that would hang out at those clubs, you know, were, were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Right. You know, before they were before they were who they are known for. Right. Um, uh, but I think you're right. I mean, uh, and a lot of that stemmed from, I mean, this was not from the uh, hallowed halls of IBM or, right. um, or Hewlett Packard or any other big, kind of the, the then big Silicon Valley firms uh, or, or technology firms. I mean, this was, and, and, and you were right when, when, when these homebrew kits were exposed to, you know, personal computers were first exposed to corporate America they kind of scratched their head and they didn't know what to do with it. And, and I think uh, extending to the hip hop analogy, I mean, it took the music industry years before they figured out what to do with hip hop. Right. And so people will say what they, what they could do to hip hop and like a more, in a more of a sinister sense, but, right. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's really, I think you're right. You know, the community versus kind of the establishment um, where people kind of get into a comfortable groove and they don't understand change. And I think that's going to be even more important because disruption is going to be the norm, right. I think, in the next 50 years rather than the exception. Well, I think we're at a particularly good time to begin exp having big tech companies begin to experiment with this because, you know, as you all know, at Microsoft, one of Satya's great passions and, and one of the things that's driving what they do is how do we democratize the technology we're building? And essentially all I'm saying is, um, we've gotten so far um, based on trial and error, um, or, or to put it another way, we're essentially where agriculture was in the 1820s or 1860s. Um, we could wait another 50 years until we figure it out, or we could say, hey, you know, these people who um, were figuring out how do you grow more apples, maybe we can use those techniques for on coding with Apple and do that now and not wait 50 years to figure it out the hard way. Right, right, right. Plus now I think there's, there's more international competition. Right. Uh, particularly China. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and their big push to AI. I think that's, uh, but I think you're right. I mean, I think our economy has kind of transformed underneath us and the, you know, there are, there are certainly some communities that are have already been marginalized, but I think there's also plenty more that are, you know, 
on that that fault line of they're about to be really marginalized, you yeah. know, or or ones that are kind of on the edge that are kind of they're okay now, but it's definitely they've seen better days. Yeah. And I want to make clear, I'm not um delusional enough to think that everyone will become a programmer. Um right. what I'm arguing is because there are some people like, well, we'll be coding it that and I don't know, maybe I'm just I seriously doubt it. Or I it wouldn't surprise me if everyone ends up doing a little bit of coding, but I doubt everyone will be making money off of it or you know right. earning a living off of it. Um my argument is because a lot of people are about to get displaced because the world's going to get turned upside down and inside out for an awful lot of folks. Um, now's the time to, to dramatically expand the number of people, you know, community by community. So no community gets left behind who are able to make a living using this tech because what we know from, you know, experience in other, you know, in other eras it's not that um, in the 1940s, like after World War II, that um, everyone was working as a steel worker or as an auto worker. But if you end up with lots of steel workers and auto workers, that can help raise an entire community. Um, and so that that's more of what I'm shooting for. Not yeah, that everyone right. will be doing this, but if we get a critical mass, it could then open up um, the you know the, the kind of wealth that we need to build up communities. Um, and also, frankly, to then pay for some of the more far out stuff folks are talking about, like universal, universal basic income or other things like that. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about in an economy like ours now, where it would be possible, but it would be rather difficult. If we can get enough people who are doing this in every community and generate a lot more wealth in those communities and overall, then it gets easier to ask what do we do for folks who are not um, who are not benefiting, or how do we make it so that more people can work for you know four day work weeks or whatever? Um, right. It just and it you know it, it just opens up a lot more space, which is the main message I'm trying to hammer home. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, so yeah. rather than trying to spend lots of time guessing, which is basically where a lot of the energy is going right now, publicly at least, let's think about strategies where, regardless of which way it goes we create options and I absolutely, well, you're absolutely right uh, sorry andy that's okay i i love that in your executive summary you've got you know this this main bullet that is three strategies for truly democratizing emerging tech and i think that that is a very pregnant header uh, in a number of ways one is that if we do not do something uh, similar to what you're espousing that democratization is going to take place and it's either going to take place in the form of the, you know, the, the rich get extremely rich and the poor get extremely poor. And we have this very polarizing and really unstable uh, out, outcome. Right. Or or there's some democratization that takes place in in what you're describing, where the, um, you know, with a little bit of prescience, the, the companies that are creating this tech that are driving this tech would uh, invest a little bit in uh, efforts like those that you're describing here, where maybe we go into Compton or we go into right. Appalachia or we work with Black Girls Code. Right. And it's not $3,500 for a HoloLens 2. Maybe they get donated a right. handful of HoloLens 2s. And we begin then plant to plant these uh, seeds. And I use that term intentionally because organic growth happens over and over again. The examples you've shared with the extension services and, and the hip hop movement and, uh, you, you know, and, and, and the communities of the geeks back in the sixties. <laughs> right. You know, all of those are examples of, you know, world economy driving engines that exist today, especially the, the technology uh, you look at that that grew out of those meetings that happened in garages 50 years ago. Um, and, and something is going to grow out of this. And it, I think the real question is, and maybe the challenge is, is it going to be something that is is the engine of growth and, and perhaps wealth and democratization for the next 50 years? Or is it going to be something disastrous? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, uh, like, so last night, tying into the science fair, everywhere you go, at least uh, in, in in my little part of the world, 
was um is there stem this and stem that for kids so science technology engineering and math when i was a kid stem was not even an acronim <laughs> um and you were kind of on the fringe you were on the right. fringe and oh, like gosh. i was i you know people say well you, you know pe some people will tell me like well you were encouraged to, to get into stem no i wasn't <laughs> not you know, by our so peers <laughs> if you count being a doctor then you know my my mom my 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 parents wanted to be a be a doctor or a lawyer uh you know and engineer would be tolerable right like so um but no i mean I, I, it's just interesting and, and and but i think it's also dangerous for us just from from any number of, of angles to have a society increasingly dependent on technology and having such a large population technology technologically illiterate yeah right that's dangerous i think it's also really dangerous if um we continue with a, not only the individual inequalities but the geographic inequalities yeah i mean one of the things that was really striking um i got my phd in sociology uh at berkeley um back in the 80s and early 90s um yeah by the way uh, if you're getting a PhD in something, the problem with doing an area like Bay Area is it's really, really nice. And so, you know, the, the impetus to get done was not, uh, let's just say Wisconsin probably would have been a better choice in terms of getting done faster. <laughs> um, but one of the things that was really striking was, as, you know, Silicon Valley was taking off um, and all these jobs were getting created. And, you know, I knew all these people were becoming millionaires overnight. Um, and they're all white boys from, you know, the Northeast or West Coast like me. And meanwhile, you know, Oakland uh, was a hop, skip and a jump away from uh, the heart of Silicon Valley. And it was creating, I mean, it was pushing uh, unemployment down a little, but none of those jobs were ending up um, in areas that had like 80, 90 percent unemployment um, right, or right. actual as opposed to statistical unemployment. Um and, um, you know, similarly now, um, the, one of the reasons, one of several reasons we have an opioid epidemic is at the same time that we've had the rise of this unbelievable tech is because um, we haven't been investing in, in a bunch of communities um, and there's just not a whole lot of hope or good work um, or for that matter, good bandwidth. Um, and so one of the key takeaways of this report is the tech world needs to stop talking just about individuals and really start talking about communities yeah. um, and not saying, I mean, it's great. Like I love code.org. Um, frankly, if I didn't have a repetitive stress injury in both my hands, I would spend a ridiculous amount of time playing <laughs> with the cool stuff that they come up with. But yeah. when they give you stats, they say, Oh, we've got all these kids who are taking this class and it's an impressive stat. But if you ask, all right, so how many people in Oakland are in a, we're in an inner city neighborhood? How many people in Lecter County, Kentucky, one of the poorest counties in the United States, are going to get a job? The answer is no one's really paying attention. And right. that's why Extension Services was so incredibly, one of the reasons why it was so effective was every single agricultural county in the United States right. had at least one, if not many, Extension Service agents. And they had to be able to report back. Here's how many farmers have started changing the way, you know, start doing these new um, approaches. And here's how many kids have joined 4-H and, and so on and so on. And we need, I mean, it's kind of ironic that in an era where we've become sort of mad for metrics mm -hmm. um, and analytics, we, the analytics that we're collecting here don't really actually get at the problem. We don't really have, like most people who are, well, let me say, of the people who are doing work in the community, they know their problem is they have no resources. They're doing it as volunteers or on a shoestring. Right. Of the companies that have more money who are saying we're, in, we're you know, influencing all these people, they're not tracking the right thing, which is not how many people took my class or downloaded my tool, but how many people actually ended up in a job that's paying them a real income. And so making the switch to focusing on communities as well as individuals is a critical part of how we level up um, and make this happen. I, I think you've nailed the analogy, Anders. I, th I think the extension services analogy is vital to the message you're trying to get out. And I, I think it truly is. A, it was a great program for agriculture and doing something similar for tech 
is also a, a great idea. Cool. Yeah. I mean, if you can get community advocates, like you said, people who speak the language, right? If right. you can identify leaders and and just provide them with the material that they need, uh, if, if they get it, then they can share it with their peers. And that's the nature uh, of any organic or grassroots movement. And I love exactly. that you're leveraging that. Uh, in, in your solution here. Um, can I give you guys a quick stat around that? Um, sure. This sort of blew my mind when I was doing research. So I ended up um, talking to someone who's a historian of uh, extension services, and he turned me on to this book about, it was written in 1948, right after the end of World War II, about the history of New York State's extension services program. And um, by 1948, the extension services folks had built a network in New York of 32,000 trained volunteer local leaders and committee members who are supported by a total of 383 agricultural and home economic staff who worked in various colleges and universities. Wow. Um, that is roughly about 1.5% of New York State's rural population. And again, this isn't how many people who are involved in some way. This is 32,000 trained um, leaders. Yeah. And the reason they will, you know, so if someone's like, we can't possibly teach people, we don't have, you know, it's just too hard. It's like, well, look at what happened to extension services. They had enough people to support a network of 1.5% of the state's rural population, or another way to cut it is about one out of every five working farms had someone who was a local leader um, in trying to make this tech easier to use and you know, training their um, their fellow farmers. Um, and I'm not suggesting we have to need 32,000 people in New York State. Um, I'm, you know, given the, the rise of the internet and so on, and um, there we can probably do it with a little less, but um, it's easy to underestimate just how much work it took for that, for that to happen, but it's also easy to underestimate what happens when you can put in when you get the, the kind of backing that people need to do something at a sort of deep level. Because, um, you know, if you don't, then, yeah, it does seem kind of nuts to people that you'd say lots of people will become JavaScript or Java or C-sharp programmers because we're not providing anywhere near the kind of support or making the tools anywhere near accessible enough to get to that level. Well, I also think, too, I think I think there's a focus on on coding, right? You know, learn to code this, learn to code that. I think it's just, you know, learn to build, learn to make, you know, uh, there's, there's plenty of interesting things in technology, whether it's code, whether it's, you know, some of the advances in biology, right? Right. I think we have to encourage, encourage a DIY kind of hacker culture. Right. Because I think, I think if, sorry, go ahead. I think you're exactly right. In fact, um, in the report, um, I talk about creating, um, a continuum of skill from power user and in, in the area of just coding from power users to blue collar coders um, to full blown developers. And part of the idea behind that is not everyone needs to be a full blown developer in order, in order to do something interesting when it comes to hardware, not everyone needs to be able to build all of it. Not everyone needs an engineering degree in order to build something interesting. The key is to make it so that like right now, the problem is, um, if you become, if you get started in in a number of areas, particularly in the world of of, of code, let's say you're, you know, you're um, uh, you're you've got some great tool that makes it easier for do for you to do some machine learning. Once you hit the limits of what that tool lets you do, there's a huge leap up to the next level. It's like, okay, now you know how to slice and dice using um, deep learning. And to go to the next level in deep learning, you need to now learn um, Python and um, five other things. So right. what we need to do is not only smooth the learning curve for getting our people started, but also smooth the curve along that, along the continuum of skill, so that, right, someone doesn't have to be a program and get started. They can just start mucking around. Um, and then as they need to learn more, they it's easy for them to do that. Um, both because the tech has been designed to smooth the learning curve to learn more and more, and because they're involved in an, a community ecosystem of support that makes it easy for them to to do that. 
Interesting. So we have a, we want to be respectful of your time. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, pre-made questions, but yep. uh, since uh, this is kind of a, a different uh, space than our normal guest, <laughs> um, uh, we kind of touched upon this, but uh, there's, there's, there's two. Uh, so I'll combine the first two questions we have. Uh, what, what do you think is holding people back? And, and, if what's your advice for people who want to break into not just coding, but data science or just, just mucking with stuff, not being afraid of open them up the box and, and playing around with stuff. So as an indiv- if you're an individual who wants to get started, um, I'd say start finding other people. Um, it's a lot easier to do this. Think about all the things you do in your life, like, getting more physically active, losing weight, um, changing the way you eat, learning a new skill. It's much easier if you find other people who are doing it or get a couple of friends who agree we're all going to do it together. Um, Because it's one thing to feel like an idiot by yourself. It's another (laughs) thing to feel like an idiot when Uh. there's five of you, right? Um, Because then you're like, well, we know we're not all idiots. So if we're feeling like idiots, that's probably okay. We'll 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 roll forward. Right. Um, if we ask how are we going to you know actually make this easier, um, just so happens that in the conclusion, um, I have the first three pages of the conclusion um, are here's what if you decide you really want to work on this, here's what you can do in your community to come up with some really exciting ambitious ideas, and then start getting your feet wet and connecting with other people. Um, I also talk a little bit about if you're at a tech company, a big tech company, and you're like, we should start figuring out how we work with the community more um, so that we can reduce how complex co- our, our tech is to use. Um, it also has some some ideas about how to do that. Um, I, I will say, if you're at Microsoft or Google, one of their big places, and you actually work in machine learning, augmented reality, et cetera, and you're like, I really want to make this happen in our company, um, Get in touch with me um, because I think I think there's room to do some really interesting things in some of the big companies that have um, a lot of resources they can they can bring to bear and to do it in a way that would both help the company, help the community, and help the world. Very cool. So, Andres, how did you find your way into this work? I mean, did you find it, or did it find you? That is a great question. Um, I've been doing databases and so on for a long time, ever since uh, high school. Um, but where I first started really thinking about, like, how do you make things more accessible was probably when in 2001, when I, um, got hired at the Service Employees International Union to help, uh, their 200 locals and 20 state councils, um, start paying attention to the quality of their data because a lot of people are trying to figure out how do we become more data-driven to mobilize our members. And it's kind of hard to do that if you have, you know, lousy phone numbers and addresses. Right. And the experience of trying to do that on such a big scale very much shaped my thinking, and you can see the results in this report. Interesting. You also said data-driven, so we're very happy when anyone says that. Oh, Yes. In fact, we're so happy. Excellent. Yeah, we haven't used that soundboard for a while. Uh, so what's your favorite part of your current gig? My favorite part of my current gig is that I get to combine the two parts of my life that has always been separate, which is helping people geek out with data and tech and thinking about complicated social and economic issues. Very cool. So we have three complete this sentence. And the very first one is, when I'm not working, I enjoy... Experimenting with cooking. Cooking? Uh, my Cooking, yes. Awesome. Uh, my doctor has convinced me to try switching to a plant-based vegan diet. Okay. And so I've used this as an excuse to play uh, and sort of up my cooking skills and see, can I capture the taste of mcdonald's burgers and not do it exactly but like get the what i liked out of mcdonald's burgers in a healthy vegan way Very uh, and cool. that's been really fun so how's that gone i mean where where are you in that did you did you succeed i am about 95 percent of the way there 
Um, there are days when I'm like, I must have ice cream and non-dairy ice cream doesn't cut it. But um, I've gotten to the point where I make pizza as opposed to ordering it. I make burgers as opposed to getting them at the local burger shop. Very cool. um, and I make Chinese as opposed to order having it delivered. Nice. I think the, here's the next one. Uh, I think the coolest thing in technology today is blank. Augmented reality, especially when you combine it with data like data visualization or machine learning. Um, about a year ago, I had a chance to teach um, a very short workshop on um, doing some coding in this thing called A-Frame, which is this open source web-based um, augment virtual, at the time virtual reality, now augmented and virtual reality um, JavaScript system. And teaching this stuff feels like teaching people how to do magic. They like just uh -huh. like, you know, you write all the code and then bing, there's an object in front of you is so freaking cool. That is awesome. Okay, one last complete this sentence. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to... Type without using my hands. Um, I have a repetitive stress injury in both uh, hands, which limits how much cool tech I can play with. And because uh, basically I do stuff by voice and there's a limit to how much I can do that. And there's, comp there's this company called Control Labs that's got this tech where you can control your computer using your brain, not by jacking directly into your, your head, but by um, basically hacking the... They put, you put on these wristbands mm -hmm. and they basically hack the signals going between your hands oh, and your neat. brain. Yeah, and they, they are getting close to allowing developers to start playing with it. And um, I am really, really psyched because it looks like it'll be a lot of fun. Nice. I've, I have heard about those, so that's that's interesting. Um, Carpal Tunnel runs in the family, so I'm a little mm. worried about that myself. Yeah. Um, uh, so we have another complete this sentence. I look forward to the... Did we just do that? I'm sorry. Yeah, we just did that one. That's okay. I'm sorry. Brain, <laughs> brain is fried. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so share something different about yourself, but do remember we like to keep our um, our clean rating on iTunes. Okay. Uh, so my brother has autism, and um, he was born before um, most folks knew what that was, mm -hmm. and before the services folks take for granted existed. And so my both of my parents got involved in the fight to build those services um, for everybody. And then um, and between watching them go through that and then also, you know, my relationship with my brother over the years, um, particularly since I was a, a smart and very arrogant young punk um, and learning, wow, you know, being smart is only one little tiny piece of the equation of what it means to be a wonderful human being early yeah. on was uh, useful. Very cool. So, Anders, where can people learn more about you and the work you're doing? Right. So I have a site called makersall.org. Um, and by the time this podcast is up, um, the report will be there, um, as well as uh, some other info. Um, and uh, there'll be um, an email list you can sign up on to keep getting informed. Um, so that's probably the best place to start. Great. Okay. So Audible is a sponsor of the show. We just want to know, uh, do you do you have any uh, audiobooks you like to recommend? Or um, do you have any book recommendations failing that? Yes, I've got um, three. Well, I'll do two books. I've got three, but I'll do two. Um, in May, there's a wonderful book calling, coming out called Ghost Work um, by Mary Gray and Siddhartha Suri. And what they did was they did an anthropological analysis of basically they hung out with people who were doing last mile automation work like the people on the other end who are uh, tagging pictures uh, for an ai or handling customer support that, an, that the ai can't um and it's fascinating work and they also sort of place it in like the history of of contingent work mm -hmm. um it's i i got to see an advanced copy and it's really really good it it fundamentally changed the way i think about uh, where we're headed. Um, another book I would strongly recommend that already is out there is um, by David M. Kennedy called Don't Shoot a Man, a Street Fellowship, and the End of Violence in Inner City America. And what it's about uh, 
is um, it's sort of an autobiographical book about um, these really amazing efforts to figure out how do we reduce the number of people who are getting killed in the inner cities, and what and what they did was this really impressive combination of very data driven analytical work to figure out you know where are, where are people losing their lives, what are their relationships, and, and essentially discovered a very small number of people in very small number of networks were responsible for the majority of deaths, and a lot of it had to do with you know, basically personal beliefs and not um, bigger things. And then they did all this qualitative work, working the community, um, figuring out strategies to reduce, uh, to convince people not to um, to do this, and then work with police to um, both be more sensitive to the community's needs and also to focus more on not all of the crime, but rather the people who essentially broke cruises and killed someone. Mm. And they were able to reduce crime in, in a number of cities by the number of violent deaths by, um, I think, 60 or 70 percent or good. more. I mean, really wow. impressive. Yeah. Um, and so if you want a read that's both a really interesting introduction to like how to think about what it means to be data driven in a really sophisticated way and how to combine it with it with very very qualitative approach and do something that has really big impact. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite books on that. Very cool. Interesting. So for those of you who don't know, uh, you can get yourself a free copy, a free audiobook of your choice. Um, uh, the data driven book.com. Is that correct, Andy? That's correct. Awesome. Help support the show. And um, maybe Andy and I will be able to go to Starbucks and get, get that extra shot in that latte. That's, that's Excellent. our goal. That's our goal. That's it. <laughs> Andres, this has been an awesome show. I, I love the, uh, the practical emphasis uh, that you place on the, on, you know, on data. Um, I, it, it, people, people that don't know you, hopefully it came through this show. I do know you. I can vouch that Andres is a real deal. Uh, he cares about folks. He wants to see folks, um, you know, helped by technology and he wants to see technology helped by people. I've had that experience working with you, uh, corporately. So I, I really appreciate your, um, your motives and, um, the fact that you took time out of your life. Uh, I won't go into too much detail there, but I know that you set aside a chunk of your life to work on this report, and it's been several months in the making. Thank you. A year. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, thank you very much. That's very kind. Yeah. Great. And with that, we'll let the nice British lady finish the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.